Welcome all of you to this live program of Big Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Russell Bodner from Chicago, Illinois, United States. After his medical graduation at UCLA, Dr. Bodner pursued residency at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, he then pursued a fellowship at, the Inns at Innsbruck, Austria, and also a Stedman Sports Medicine Fellowship. He has been certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and also recertified in 2012. He joined Redwood Orthopedic Surgery Associate at Santa Rosa in 1989 and now works at Orthopedic Surgery Regional Medical Group in Sycamore, Illinois, Chicago, United States. He has published several papers and mostly about safe zone and spinal pelvic alignment and has this high impact for his publications. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Russell Bodner from Chicago, United States. Over to you, Dr. Bodner. Thank you, Dr. Gopalan, for the opportunity to share my insights on this timely topic in hip, hip replacement surgery. Here are my disclosures, which are not relevant to the material presented. I'll always acknowledge Dr. Larry Dore, who gave me my chance, gave me my voice, gave me the opportunity to contribute to his work and to our field. I can safely say that all I have accomplished was done because he was the only approval that mattered to me and no one worked any harder to help him achieve his research goals. LDD, this one's for you. My goal is to broaden a perspective of listeners' minds regarding how hip replacements work within the human body. We will study how biomechanical principles, we will study biomechanical principles not addressed in textbooks or traditional planning. I'll take you on a deep dive down a rabbit hole that has no bottom in sight but we will reemerge more equipped to analyze, classify, and address patients that require a different approach than what we've been taught or developed as our standard workup. Pattern recognition and measurements have always been the hallmark of orthopedic surgery. So warm up your goniometers and hold on, because here we go. Here's the fundamental problem. Evolution had the audacity to take a quadruped tree climbing animal and attempt to defy gravity by raising it up onto only two legs. A balancing act played out over a million years, accomplished primarily through pelvic and spinal reorganization. Less prodigious perhaps, in the beginning of orthopedic radiology this last century, we studied the hip by lying a patient flat onto a table, asking them to hold perfectly still, and producing a single two-dimensional coronal picture of the pelvis and hip joint, which we were only too happy to use developing skills to implant prostheses with efficiency and safety. Unfortunately, people's bodies do move in space. We are connected beings built with a postural kinetic chain, and our patients know this innately. That is because rule number one of the body is to control gravity, a cone of balance or muscular economy described by the great John Dubasset a half century ago. Hence the problem of subspecialized surgical dogmas. Spinal surgery relies on lateral measurements, including dynamic flexion extension values, but in the singular standing posture, while hip surgery relies wholly on a coronal plane static supine analysis. Between them, missing pieces are profound and create a state of confusion and isolationism that defines our current practice and has been a prime motivator for my work. The first principle I realized in finding common ground required putting the hip joint back into the postural system where it functions. I disagreed with Dubasset's idea that the pelvis was basically an extension of the vertebral column, implied in calling it the pelvic vertebrae. I visualized his os intercalare or intercalary bone as a specialized central idler gear in a three gear train, a concept straight out of mechanical engineering. This central gear moves in opposite direction to the two outer gears and synchronizes their movements. This is exactly what occurs, except the pelvis oscillates to the front and back, forward causing obligate extension of the spine and hip and backward driving flexion of both. When I shared this concept with Dr. Dore in 2017, he had it illustrated. 
putting hinges at the spine and hip instead of gears and published it in the 2018 late dislocation paper in JBJS that introduced Nate Heckman's concept of the combined sagittal index. He laughingly told me and a friend visiting him that in his fellowship days, Dr. Ranawa told him that all good ideas become my ideas. And in fact, he left me out of the paper. I considered this a cover charge for getting my ideas published in JBGS. Without him, the concept could never see the light of day. It's a true story. The language of postural biomechanics includes angles and displacements. The spine surgeons have mapped out the sagittal parameters of the kinetic chain using global and regional measures to turn deformity surgery into an age-dependent realignment algorithm. Now I was going to include the acetabular and lower extremity angles into this complex environment with whatever additional angles I needed to find. This was my agenda, while I helped Dr. Dorr with his. And to assist my efforts, I had access to whatever clinical data he emailed me to analyze. As I did my readings, it became obvious why hips squarely within the Lewinick zone dislocate. The cup may be fine supine, but a patient with abnormal pelvic, lumbar, and femoral movements can take that construct on a joyride to disaster. Hips with too open combined orientation standing or too close sitting will impinge and force mechanical instabilities. So you have to study the pelvis, but lateral pelvic views do not give great information at the hip joints as they overlap, and often the laterals are hard for techs to get. The critical information is not at the acetabulum. It is found in describing the three parameters comprising the pelvic gear itself. Two are positionally dynamic, changing in reciprocal fashion as people move, but when the sum of the two are added together, they always equal the constant third. This constant parameter is called the pelvic incidence, and the two positional parameters, sacral slope and pelvic tilt. It is the functional behavior of these parameters that determines what angle the cup should go. Acetabular parameters are calculations in relationship to pelvic values. Pelvic incidence is evolution's masterpiece, rearranging to positions of two anatomical points in space. One is the axis of rotation connecting both hip joints, the other the center of the spinal load bearing down on top of the S1 end plate. This arrangement is radically different from the apes. The sacrum became folded into a variable C shape and brought down into the pelvis behind the hip center. This permitted the magic of hyperextension necessary to rise up off all fours. But there is still a huge range of 60 degrees in pelvic incidence, creating a great variation in function and patterns of deterioration. Looking deeper, the horizontal and vertical separation of these points create a radius for pelvic rotation, allows for a positioning of the body in relation to the gravity line with a moderate relationship to the folded slope angle of the S1 plateau. The shorter the radius and further behind the hips, the top of S1 lies, the greater the forward sloping. This is incredi incredibly meaningful because the slope of the sacrum controls the amount and shape of the lumbar lordosis as simultaneously the PT controls body position in relationship to gravity. Pelvic rotation is the prime mechanism the body uses to achieve a balanced posture in different poses. Pelvis rows forward, driving extension, back driving flexion. This begs the question, what is the normal relationship between these three parameters? And what happens to them when one or both gears attached to the pelvis wears out? Only after learning this will we know enough to attempt to place a cup properly into this moving system. The normal relationships have actually been described multiple times in the spine literature, but only standard. I looked at these and did hundreds, if not thousands of examples 
<clears throat> to find something that worked in multiple positions. I found the simplest ratios between the parameters produced answers in simple fractions and matched solutions based on Dr. Doerr's clinical data. If PI goes up three degrees, SS goes up two and PT one. This gives a linear slope of two thirds or 0.667 for SS and one third or 0.333 for PT. This table plots my equation with three spinal ones over the range of physiological PIs. Cup angles derived from these equations differ by fractions of these differences. This was definitely an aha moment in my quest. We're still a ways from where do I put my cup. This is background. And we need to know what a cup angle is looking from the side. This was originally called several names until Dr. Dorr declared it should be named anti-inclination, AI, as it includes both the influence of a large inclination ellipse, as well as an operative plane antiversion component. So now armed and dangerous, it's time to leave the coronal plane behind and dive ever deeper into a new and strange reality. In 2003 Nishihara paper, sagittal pelvic mobility using the three modern postures was studied measuring APP tilts. The finding could be cast in stone as fully 15% of patients could not be safely planned using traditional methods a number that still holds to this day. The sitting position not traditionally considered was often the spoiler. But it was this figure, first published in 2004, that drew me into the fray. Dr. Lazanek's descriptions of sagittal plane mechanics and pathomechanics literally rocked my world in 2015. Clear as day, we have a cup positioned perfectly with regard to the position of the pelvis acting as a retractable roof over the flexing femur. The angle produced was a constant, and like SS and PT, the cup acted as a reciprocal positional parameter to the very same sacral slope angle found in the pelvic incidence equation. Lazanek never solved his creation for clinical application. This geometric gauntlet had been thrown down, and I had found my career challenge. I set out to solve this riddle. I had very good ideas using Dr. Doerr's clinical values for the AI cup angles, but I needed more to be convincing to a major publication. I looked for a mathematical method based on these angles. I could resolve the two equations for the common SS value, creating what I called the governing equation, tying the cup to the pelvic angles. This would be a check that had to solve whatever conditions I chose to input. Better still, I overlapped the two equations onto a lateral view of the pelvis. To my surprise, a central triangle, which in fact had always been there, was created with all the pelvic and acetabular parameters represented. I was ecstatic, as now all the rules of trigonometry were at my disposal, and the SAA angle was simply a corner angle in a triangle with one fixed angle determined by the measurable PI. There was one new angle at the hip in this triangle. I named it the pelvic acetabular angle, PAA, and its meaning blew me away. It was analogous to Lazenek's SAA, only it described the cup's relationship to the PT angle just as SAA did to the SS angle. With a fixed apex angle, this whole game came down to shifting values between reciprocal SAA and PAA angles reflecting relative positions or balance of the PI-derived SS and PT angles. And what would be the perfect state of balance in a triangle like this? An isosceles triangle with equal SAA and PAA coronal angles. We had normative pelvic values and equal corner angles. The single missing unknown is the AI cup angle itself. And at this point, the riddle was solvable if the patient never moved from the standing position, but they do move. And that leaves us with the sticky mobility issue. As it turns out, 
Altered mobility has a very straightforward solution if you learn an interesting trick. Mobility preservation dictates that the cup and pelvis move together over an, over an identical arc of mobility. Changing mobility is similar to opening or closing an old fashioned hand fan. One degree of opening changes both ends by half a degree. In the hip, lowering mobility or stiffness one degree raises the optimal standing cup position one half a degree and lowers sitting one half degree. This matches the cup's arc to that of the pelvis. Increasing mobility has the opposite effect of lowering the standing cup AI and raising the sitting cup AI each by half a degree. The magic trick is that these changes do not emanate from zero degrees, but from a unique value that matches the balanced condition of the isosceles triangle in standing. The geometrical answer for this trick is 25 degrees mobility. This matches the two sides and two corner angles. This mobility does not change the standing isosceles condition in any way. The intact triangle simply rotates in space around the hip axis as illustrated here. It is a mathematical proof that cup position is never determined by surgical choice. It is the passive resultant of the patient's own mechanics and the optimal cup's value is what's left over under the triangle measured to the horizontal reference as the anti-inclination AI angle. Let me simplify and summarize this in a table. It shows the solution for all the pelvic and acetabular angles at this neutral 25 degree mobility angle. These ratios show exactly how much each parameter changes relative to each other. The ratios may be read horizontally across the rows, PI6, SS4, PT2, AI minus one, the equal SS and SAA and PAA3. Additionally, it is possible to calculate any cup tilt adjustment from this chart, with the answer still reflecting the 25 degree mobility, which then must be corrected next when it's not 25 degrees. These are the individual effects of tilt changes in SS and PT from the normative values, as well as the mobility changes from 25 degrees. These ideal AI cup calculations do not account for either femoral version outliers or the temporal changes occurring after the operation. It is perhaps the most accurate planning algorithm for spinal pelvic influences on cup position in existence. In coronal antiversion, accuracy is 0 0.2 degrees. This is a table version for complete tilt and mobility adjusted SAA and standing AI cup values. Simply measure a standing SS and find it along the top and determine the delta to the sitting position and find that on the column and geometry works to 0 0.25 degrees sagittal. Mobility has the largest effect on cup position, twice per degree influence on AI values as the tilt adjustment has. I know this looks very complicated, but if we plot out these points onto a graph, the solution to Lazenek's riddle looks like this. The parallel mobili mobility lines all share the linear slope of the tilt adjustment correction. Standing and sitting pelvic positions with customized optimal cup angles and the angle between that cup and the sacral slope. It is the bespoke total hip arthroplasty that Dr. Haddad editorialized in his British joint journal about four years ago. I shared all this so people could learn in the Journal of Arthroplasty, and here is the reference. So let's climb out of that rabbit hole and look how others go about evaluating and creating solutions. There are two types, X-ray and CT. Lateral standing and a type of sitting is done, then measure a bunch of parameters in both positions, define the outliers, 
and then follow recommended positions. CT-based programs provide 3D anatomic models that can be jiggered in space until they impinge and cups moved until they look best. Don't read this slide. I show it only to illustrate that besides my methodology, there are four other non-proprietary developed classification systems offering cup recommendations, and that all of these work by measuring standing values, sitting values, with or without mention of the combined version effects. Let's look closer. Of all the positions, standing has the most applicability for planning cup position. It is the most predictable functional position, and it is typically close to the supine Lewinick zone surgeons understand, making it an easy adjustment to target its position fluoroscopically at surgery. Normative values are well known to use, but just how close is standing to supine? The OPS group showed that when exposed to gravity standing, the pelvis rocks back an average of 5.5 degrees equivalent to raising anaversion by four degrees. The range can go as high as minus 20 degrees and is the pelvic compensation for truncal inclination from spinal disease pushing the gravity line forward. Upright sitting, like standing, is a balancing act, a maneuver using lower lumbar spine and hip flexion. It is flexion with a balanced trunk. This can be influenced by body habitus such as obesity. When paired with standing, it, be, it can be used to plan where the cup should go for those two poses. Delta stand to upright sitting is the most commonly understood and misunderstood spinal pelvic parameter. We published it strictly as pelvic mobility, SS and PT, but often it gets confused with lumbar spine mobility. The less than 10 degrees stiff, 11 to 30 normal, and greater than 30 hypermobile classification of Dr. Dorr is used in the vast majority of planning platforms where cup antiversion is inversely related to pelvic mobility. THA candidates average 15 degrees more antiverted sitting than standing. It has been the dynamic inclusion of the sitting position that creates the individualized paradigm changing THA planning forever. Flex sitting is a test position for posterior instability risk. It identifies lumbar spines that behave as a rigid stick would, stiff above and below the apex of the lumbar lordosis. The whole spinal pelvic unit flexes on the hip joint. The trunk is not balanced here. It is falling forward, and if the pelvis follows well anterior to the standing position, it is a great test for this risk. This data provides guidance for raising cup antiversion when combined with 3D CT simulation. And after THA restores more hip flexion, it's possible for this condition to get even worse. Now we have the measurements. Now we have to look for outliers. How is standing? Look on the lateral film and try to identify these red flags. The two coronal tips are qualitative and serve to alert one to do the full proper evaluation. All may be familiar to you, save this last one. PFA greater than 200. What is this value? PFA may just be the most important parameter for the future of THA planning. Not many appreciate the value of the pelvic femoral angle, the name christened by Dr. Dorr from a former spinal parameter. It's measured from the center of F S1 to the hip center, which is the PT line, to a line parallel to the anterior femoral shaft. It is a pure measure of both sides of the hip joint's position in space, the combined flexion and extension of the acetabulum and femur. It responds to balance all the loss of lordosis in the spine and is affected primarily by hip disease and flexion contracture. It is a spinal pelvic barometer, includes the primary balancer of gravity, that PT angle we talked about within it. PFA 
outliers standing, sitting, or the delta between positions directly relates to where a cup's true bullseye belongs. Now on to sitting. Sitting has greater variability than standing, but there are triggers for outliers. You can look for the pelvis that does not go back far enough in upright sitting or goes too far forward in flex sitting or measure PFA that is too low in either sitting position. A delta lumbar lordosis between standing and flex seated less than 20 degrees is a great measure for patients to have an outlier flex sitting position. Finally, understand how things change when hip mobility is restored by THA. Hip-based pathologies, such as flexion contractures or pelvic hypermobility, compensating for the loss of hip flexion resolve back towards normal mechanics, while spinal conditions above the pelvis or neuromuscular diseases do not. Back pain is often relieved by THA because the back doesn't need to compensate with greater mobility to make up for the dysfunctional hip. Armed with all this information, you can now choose recommended positions based on published guidelines. Some have combined antiversion, which typically are 25 to 50 degrees. Here is a simplified plot I made for Dr. Doerr's mobility classification placed within the Lewinick zone. He kept the roof at 25 degrees antiversion as that was the Lewinick limit, but I did draw the roof at 30 degrees as it seemed a natural progression to have stiff patients go higher. The HSS simplified classification system is very similar to the original FAN classification from 2015 with improved but still qualitative recommendations. They recommended controlling combined antiversion, but a great deal of these patients were planned using the MAKE OCT simulations so numbers or adjustments for femoral outliers are not included. These coronal recommendations are for the standing position. So their 30 relates well to Dr. Doerr's 25 as we discuss the four degree average difference between these positions. Charles Riviera's Bordeaux system is like his region's wine. Brilliant, complex, perhaps too complex for the common man. His recommendations are very good. The work of George Gramatopoulos' group is exceptional. He is publishing great data and has incorporated PFA and AI cup values to report safe zones using our combined sagittal index con uh, concept. I must show you how this works. CSI takes the spinal pelvic position of the hip joint, PFA, and adds the AI cup value to it in both standing and seated positions to see if the synchronized construct is too far extended in standing or too flexed in sitting. It complements combined antiversion and has been validated as a true functional safe zone measure for both acute and chronic dislocations. Very precise limits have been published. Our group stratified by PI for both positions and a nearly identical standing value for the Ottawa group. The beauty is that CSI can provide guidance not only for dislocation, but for impingement occurring. I believe CSI will be adopted in total hip planning in the coming years as more people realize combined mobility of both sides of the hip joint is as important as a, is as important a factor as a combined antiversion of the components. Which is more important, CSI or combined antiversion? When asked, Dr. Dorr felt it was combined antiversion as he felt this was the best measure of containment of the femoral ball within the acetabular liner. But Ideen Poor at Yale has shown in the lab combined antiversion is not as simple as the McKibben or Ranawat definitions imply. It is multifactorial with different characteristics on each side as well as within stem design. So there remains room for further development and discovery here. We made it. The takeaways I'll address in levels of understanding. For newcomers, component position planning is a sagittal plane exercise. The most sophisticated digital planning software cannot help at all unless it includes lateral pelvic views. The tr traditional supine position is typically close to the standing posture, 
but it is the delta supine to stand and stand to sitting position that is the missing link in these planning methods. Most spinal pelvic imbalances are solved by increasing the cup's aniversion, raising sitting version from too low to avoid anterior impingement and lower ridiculously high anatomically placed aniversion to just high acceptable levels to avoid posterior impingement in standing. If you don't look, you're just an ostrich with your head stuck in the ground. Level two targeters should understand the difference between pelvic and lumbar spine mobilities, how upright and flex seated analyses differ. Dr. Andrew Shimon in Melbourne has, produ has produced wonderful animations illustrating this and I recommend everyone find them online. Do not rely on spinal hardware as the warning sign for pelvic stiffness. Anatomic stiffness of the lumbosacral junction from arthritic change is more common and age itself is as good a parameter. Standing imbalance is a key measure of a sick postural system. Look for it in everyone and understand they have high risk as THA does not fix structural spine disease. Learn about PFA and CSI because that will become the new safe zone measure. And for those few aces who really like this stuff, throw a lot of these recommendations away because the future lies not in planning based on preoperative measures of a sick hip, but in predictive planning of where the patient will land with a restored hip function at time points in the future but you can't begin to appreciate that without understanding the ground I covered here. Combined functional antiversion will become more sophisticated and adjustments made using versions of sliding scales. Finally, incorporating STEM design features into planning may one day become relevant because research has shown that they are. I leave you with this. Nothing is ever complete until you look where you haven't looked before. Leonardo found the circle and the square in his Vitruvian man because he looked only at anatomy from the front. But we found the triangle, nature's third primary shape, the Bodnerian hip, because we decided to look from the side. Innovation can be as simple as this. That's it, boss. Thank everybody for taking this ride with me. Thank you, Dr. Bodner, for this very enlightening presentation. Dr. Bodner, you can stop sharing. There's something called a stop share at the bottom. Yeah, I, I can't see where you're at. <laughs> no problem. Okay, let me try something. Mm -hmm. The green at the bottom, can you see? Oh. Yeah, perfect, Dr. Bodner. Uh, Dr. Bodner, thank you for this very enlightening presentation. A lot of new information. And really, those complex equations you have tried to make it, make it a bit simple. I did my best. It's not simple. <laughs> it is not exactly. But my my idea was that this could be reviewed on YouTube multiple times by people who are interested. They can exactly. go back. They can look at the tables. They can think about this. And in reality, what I did was. Uh, high school level geometry or trigonometry. I mean, I'm not trained as a mathematician nor an engineer. I just saw a problem and did my best to solve it. Thank you, Dr. Bodner. Uh, Dr. Bodner, let's take a few questions. Uh, Dr. Bodner, a very common scenario is a patient with ankylosing spondylitis, right? So in when you have such a patient who has a spine disease and a hip disease, very commonly we get asked, which one to operate first? So how do you go about it? So the, the, the question of 
coexistent disease between the hip and the spine. So th it's a very important topic. And it, typically it's, it's been decided based on symptomatology. Is there neurologic symptoms? Not mechanical reasons. My feeling is if the, my feeling is that if a very large correction that is gonna reposition the pelvis in space is required, that should go first. Because then after the pelvis is repositioned, you can make your calculations. The spine surgeons actually make their calculations the opposite way. They, they would look at a hip and say, if there is a hip flexion contracture, do the hip first because the flexion contracture goes away, the pelvis rocks back the other way, and then they can make theirs. So, so at this point, there's still no consensus and the papers are fairly split when you look at which goes first. But I, I think it, because we don't understand the connected biomechanics of the two yet, how much one operation affects the other, it's hard to, to make very um, strong recommendations. But other, typically it's which symptoms are worse, which uh, are their neurologic symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Bodner. Uh, Dr. Bodner, also in the US, I mean, a lot of surgeons use the EOS software, EOS, right? Yes. Uh, so what do you, do you think there's a significant advantage with the use of those? Uh, is it available everywhere? I, I think it's only available in some, some centers, right? Is it well, commonly? Not, no, no, it's not very common uh, around uh, the country. It is more um, located in centers, places where spine surgery, especially scoliosis in the young is done because of the low radiation dose. I mean, it's, uh, it's somewhat... Uh, akin to a CT in that you can get multiplanar anatomy, but the beauty of the EOS machine is that it does functional imaging. You can see the patient standing, you can see the patient sitting. And, and uh, the software that goes along with it, they have hip EOS planning software is, is wonderful. I just don't think it's been appreciated enough or tied directly to navigation and implementation devices. So, um, I mean, it's a secret for people who have it and know how to use it. I think it's a wonderful invention. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Bodner. Just one last question before I end the session, Dr. Bodner. Uh, Dr. Bodner, I just wanted to, you to take to this paper by Dr. Larry Dorr. He published in 2019, the depth of the 11x safe zone. I'm sure you've seen that. And he believes that the, I mean, 11x safe zone is not, I mean, it's almost come to an end. But for a young surgeon, it's so important, right? The paper written by Levinek, it still holds true, isn't it? Like 15 degrees of antiversion and 40 degrees of cup inclination. That's where you start with, isn't it? No. <laughs> the, the editorial was written by Dr. Dorr and the editor at the time uh, of the journal. I knew about it and my comments to Dr. Dorr as he uh, showed me a draft was, let him have it. The Lewinick zone is obsolete. A lot of, it's a huge zone and an individual's target can and should be found within that zone. Some people have a large target. So you can do mediocre placement and the cup and stem with big heads is tolerant enough so the hip won't dislocate. It can still impinge, it can still loosen, it can still have unexplained revisions at 10 years. Whereas um, modern thinking is to find a smaller target, maybe three by three within that zone. Thank you, Dr. Bodner. Dr. Bodner, thank you. That's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I'm sure it's going to reach to all interested orthopedic surgeons all over the world. Well, thank you again so much for the opportunity. I took this very seriously as a teaching lesson for a very difficult topic that a lot of people struggle with. Thank you so much.